One Christmas was so much like another in those years around the sea town corner now and out of all sound except the distant speaking of the voices. I sometimes hear a moment before sleep here in prison that I can never remember whether it snowed for six days and six nights when I was twelve, or whether it snowed for twelve days and twelve nights when I was six. All the Christmases roll down toward the two-tongued sea like a cold and headlong moon bundling down the sky that was our street, and they stop at the rim of the ice-edged, fish-freezing waves, and I plunge my hands in the snow and bring out whatever I can find. In goes my hand into that wool-white, bell-tongued ball of holidays resting at the rim of the carol-singing sea, and out come Mrs. Prothero and the firemen. It was the afternoon of the Christmas Eve, and I was in Mrs. Prothero's garden, waiting for cats like a psychopath with her son Jim. It was snowing. It was always snowing at Christmas. December in my memory is white as Lapland. It was snowing. It was always snowing at Christmas. December in my memory was as white as Lapland, though there were no reindeer. There were cats. Patient, cold, and callous, our hands wrapped in socks, we waited to snowball the cats. Sleek and long as jaguars and horrible whiskered, spitting and snarling, they would slink and sidle over the white back garden walls, and the lynx-eyed hunters, Jim and I, Fur-capped and moccasin trappers from Hudson Bay off Mumbles Road would hurl our deadly snowballs at the green of their eyes. The wise cats never appeared. We were so still, arctic marksmen in the muffling silence of the eternal snows, eternal ever since Wednesday, that we never heard Mrs. Prothero's first cry from her igloo at the bottom of the garden, or if we heard it at all, it was to us, like the far-off challenge of our enemy and prey, the neighbor's polar cat. But soon the voice grew louder. Fire, cried Mrs. Prothero, and she beat the dinner gong. And we ran down the garden with the snowballs in our arms toward the house. And smoke indeed was pouring out of the dining room, and the gong was bombulating. And Mrs. Prothero was announcing ruin like a town crier in Pompeii. This was better than all the cats and whales standing on the wall in a row. We bounded into the house, laden with snowballs, and stopped at the open door of the smoke-filled room. Something was burning, all right. Perhaps it was Mr. Pantero, who always slept there after midday dinner with a newspaper over his face. But he was standing in the middle of the room saying, a fine Christmas, and smacking at the smoke with a slipper. Call the fire brigade, cried Miss Pantero as she beat the gong. There won't be there, said Mr. Pantero. It's Christmas. There was no fire to be seen, only clouds of smoke, and Mr. Prothero was standing in the middle of them, waving his slipper as though he were conducting. Do something, he said, and threw all our snowballs into the smoke. I think we missed Mr. Prothero and ran out of the house to the telephone box. Let's call the police as well, Jim said, and the ambulance. And Ernie Jenkins, he likes fires. But we only called the fire brigade, and soon the fire engine came, and three tall men in helmets brought a hose into the house, and Mr. Prothero got out just in time before they turned it on. Nobody could have had a noisier Christmas Eve. And when the firemen turned off the hose and were standing in the wet, smoky room, Jim's aunt, Miss Prothero came down and peered in at them. Jim and I waited very quietly to hear what she would say to them. She said the right thing, always. She looked at the three tall firemen in their shining helmets, standing among the smoke and cinders and dissolving snowballs, and she said, Would you like anything to read? But here, 
a small boy says, It snowed last year, too. I made a snowman, and my brother knocked it down, and I knocked my brother down, and then we had tea. But that was not the same snow, I say. Our snow was not only shaken from whitewashed buckets down the sky, it came shawling out of the ground and swam and drifted out of the arms and hands and bodies of the trees. Snow grew overnight on the roofs of the houses like a pure and grandfather moss, minutely white ivied the walls and settled on the postman, opening the gate like a dumb, numb thunderstorm of white, torn Christmas cards. Go on to the useless presents. Bags of moist and many colored jelly babies and a folded flag and a false nose and a tram conductor's cap and a mag machine that punched tickets and rang a bell. Never a catapult. Once by mistake that no one could explain, a little hatchet and a celluloid wounded duck that made when you pressed it a most unduck-like sound, a mewing moo that an ambitious cat might make who wished to be a cow, and a painting book in which I could make the grass, the trees, the sea, and the animals any color I pleased, and still the dazzling sky blue sheep are grazing in the red field under the rainbow build and pea green birds. Hard-boileds, toffee, fudge, and all sorts, crunches, cracknels, humbugs, glaciers, marzipan, and butter Welsh for the Welsh, and troops of bright tin soldiers who, if they could not fight, could always run, and snakes, and families, and happy ladders, and easy hobby games for little engineers, complete with instructions, oh, easy for Leonardo, and a whistle to make the dogs bark, to wake up the old man next door, to make him beat on the wall with his stick, to shake our picture off the wall. And a packet of cigarettes, you put one in your mouth, and you stood at the corner of the street, and you waited for hours in vain for an old lady to scold you for smoking a cigarette. And then with a smirk you ate it. And then it was breakfast under the balloons. And that was 2020. <laughs>